Hello again, Hopewell Prez. It's great to be back with you again. I'm Heath Carter, and I'm an associate professor of American Christianity at Princeton Seminary. Um, so last time I talked a little bit about sort of the intersection of race and Christianity and identity. And today I want to uh, sort of think with you about another topic that's really sort of central uh, to my interests and my research, and I think also hopefully to um, the life of your church. And that's the question of how, as Christians, we engage in public life. Um, so obviously a lot to say here. Again, we're going to kind of fly through this because we don't have a ton of time. Um, but I hope that this will, again, get you uh, to sort of stir up a, another good conversation for all of you. Um, and again, I want to start with a story. So growing up in Kansas and then in Southern California um, in the 1980s and 1990s, um, I really lived my early life in what I would think of as kind of the long shadow of the moral majority. This was a movement that was founded in the late 70s, but that really exercised a lot of influence in um, American life in the 1980s and 1990s, um, you know, really helped to uh, buoy the fortunes of political candidates and get lots of Christians involved at the grassroots. And as someone growing up sort of in the long shadow of this movement, I was one of many, many, many American Christians who um, could hardly imagine as a, as a child growing up that one could be a Christian and be anything other than a Republican. In fact, I think uh, I heard it many, many times said in, in my home and in my church communities that um, it would really just be impossible to be, to be a Democrat and to be a Christian. And a sort of implication was that if God... If God could vote, God would certainly vote uh, the Republican ticket. Um, I, I got to college and, uh, you know, sort of came with that inheritance um, into college. And uh, God, of course, has a sense of humor. And so I got uh, randomly paired with a college roommate who was also a Christian, um, but whose father was a Democratic congressman. And so we spent all you know so many nights our freshman year living together in village c west um just going round and round about all sorts of other issues uh all sorts of kinds of issues and you know the thing that as i as i reflect back on that experience now um that's so striking to me is that until i met my roommate i really hadn't encountered uh, a serious christian who thought differently about politics than I did, um, or who had made different sorts of connections between kind of the gospel and um, public life. So whether you think the moral majority is a great thing or a terrible thing, um, I'm not really, you know, this session is not so much about that. Um, it's more about trying to kind of give some context. Obviously, the moral majority had a very strong vision of what it meant to bring one's faith into public life and a vision that, again, has really been uh, deeply influential on the kind of course that the nation's taken in the last generation. Um, but it's not the only way that Americans in the past have envisioned the relationship of faith and public life or what it might mean to live in a society that better reflected Christian values. Um, if we look at sort of the sources of the moral majority, uh, historians have written a lot about this in, in recent years. There's been a lot of interest, probably again, because of the significance uh, politically, culturally of the movement. Um, probably three main things come to mind uh, in terms of thinking about the kind of the origins of this particular way that the moral majority offered of, of connecting faith and politics. Uh, one big source was certainly a backlash to the New Deal. Um, we know that starting in the 1930s and the 1940s, um, strong partnerships began to be forged between certain church communities and um, leaders in the business world who, who really resented the New Deal and the welfare state and um, thought it was an imposition and, and, and a very bad thing for America and a very deeply unchristian thing. Um, Moral majority also certainly gained energy in the course of the backlash to the civil rights movement. And we know that, uh, as I mentioned in the section on race, that um, for many, many uh, conservative Christians in this country, 
the integration of public schools um, seemed like a dire threat to Christian America. Um, that's all over kind of the, the documentary record of the 1960s and 1970s and the letters that you read of parents who are connecting the possibility of integration to the kind of downfall of Christian society. And it seems like a strange thing to make, strange kind of connection maybe to, to make uh, for us today, but it was made um, sort of all over the map um, in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, this was a period, uh, you know, relatedly when the kind of private Christian school movement really gained ground. And not all Christian schools have roots in the battles over the integration of the public schools, but many do. Um, sometimes uh, historians have called these segregation academies because they were created as alternative outlets for Christians who didn't want to send their children, white Christians who didn't want to send their children to integrated public schools. So you've got the backlash to the New Deal, backlash to civil rights, and then, of course, um, backlash to changing norms, societal norms around gender and sexuality. And obviously those continue to be drivers of, of the religious right, even into the 21st century. Um, so I'm, I'm imagining that many of you are familiar with this tradition. Again, this is the one when people think about uh, kind of Christianity and public life, how does uh, as a Christian, how do I approach public questions? Um, this is the thing that many, many people today have in mind because it's the tradition that's sort of been most significant and most influential in the lifetime of most people who are living today. Um, and it continues to kind of, its legacies continue to extend into, into the present and, and beyond, um, as I think um, are very clear from reading the newspaper and any given day. But there's another tradition in American public life and the history of American Christianity that I want to just introduce you to at least briefly today and that I think you may find to be of interest as you kind of sort through what does it mean for us as Christians to faithfully enter the public square. Um, and I'm going to call that tradition social Christianity. It's a, it's a tradition I'm, I'm quite interested in. I'm writing a book about it right now. So anytime you find me, uh, if you see me out on the street somewhere, feel free to, to let me you know, introduce yourself and we can talk social Christianity as much as you want. Um, the way I think about this tradition is a tradition in American life of Christians who have entered the public square um, out of a sense that God called them to fight inequality in all of its various forms, um, economic inequality, racial inequality, gender inequality, and more. Um, this is a tradition that you'll find in theologically conservative churches. It's a tradition that you'll find in theologically liberal churches. It's a tradition that you'll find in Protestant and Catholic churches. Black and white and Latinx churches. Um, I think of it as a very broad tradition in American life and one that in its own day um, really deeply shaped the course of the nation, even though for most folks, uh, you know, we've, we've kind of forgotten about it altogether at this point. So I want to kind of go back and, and try to bring this tradition to life in the next few minutes um, and then hopefully give you something to talk about with one another. Um, I would argue that social Christianity as a kind of way for Christians to engage the public square um, really gets its going in black communities. And this kind of connects to some of the stuff that I was talking about um, in the previous session on, on race. And that's that um, black Christians didn't need to read theological treatises to find their way to the th sort of theological and ethical conviction that God um, was on their side and that God uh, believed in human in inequality of all people. Um, they felt that intuitively and they built churches and traditions and movements that reflected that kind of bedrock conviction. And so I think in the witness of um, early black abolitionists, um, preachers and prophets and um, leaders of of all sorts of kind of freedom movements in early America uh, is where you'd find maybe the origins of this tradition, along with the witness of some Quakers who were always uh, near the forefront of movements for equality in early America, um, and even some evangelicals. You may be familiar with that term. It's a term that you kind of can find in the newspaper uh, a lot these days because evangelicals remain very important in American politics. In their origins, evangelicals were people that um, really deeply believe that God spoke to the individual. And part of what that meant, there was a kind of uh, radically egalitarian aspect to it, 
where um, God didn't, as it turned out, only speak to white men, but God spoke to the enslaved, God spoke to women. So even though evangelicals didn't always fight for equal rights for everyone, sometimes they did. Um, we can see in their religious communities, at the very least, a kind of uh, egalitarian instinct um, that would eventually sort of um, fade into a kind of... A, less prominent role in their community's life. But certainly in, in early America, you could also count evangelicals as among those where you'd find some of the roots or some precedents for this social Christian tradition. It really gets moving in uh, the wake of the Civil War, where you have kind of the rise, industrialization, the kind of revolution in, in modern life that, that factories and wages brought. When I talk to my students about this era, you know, so many of us, it's, 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 a, it's a moment, these, these post-Civil War decades, when so much of the world that we know kind of comes into being. Um, many of us, I certainly have worked many jobs for wages um, along the way in my life. That was not something that most people had done prior to the Civil War. People worked the land, they worked, uh, they were apprentices or whatnot, but they weren't, the kind of wage system was coming into a new prominence in the post-Civil War industrializing world. And it was a world of growing inequality. And it was a movement, excuse me, it was a world that gave rise to powerful grassroots movements for equality. Many of these uh, led by uh, grassroots, everyday Christians that you've never heard of, people like you and me, who um, were led into the public square um, as they understood it by God through their reading of scriptures. And um, you could find them in movements for labor rights, for um, shorter hours and better wages and better working conditions. You could find them in movements of farmers who were decrying kind of uh, the oppression of Wall Street um, and the financial industry and, and who were standing up for the rights of, typically they would have phrased it probably as the common man. Um, it was a kind of gendered component to their activism. You could find it in movements of, of women moving to the kind of quote unquote worst neighborhoods in urban America. These are hardcore uh, kind of inner city slum districts where um, women in many cases took the lead in founding what were called settlement houses. And these were, these were places where um, these often middle class women, Christian women of privilege would uh, dedicate, you know, in some cases, the, the entirety of their adult lives to living among the poor with a vision not of just charity, but a vision of justice and a vision of kind of solidarity with the poor. Um, I, think about I think of someone like Mary McDowell, who was just a, a kind of phenomenal witness in, in this industrializing era. She was formed in the Methodist tradition, and when she was kind of a middle-aged woman of kind of great privilege, she moved to the worst neighborhood in Chicago by most of her peers' uh, kind of standards and, and lived the remainder of her life there. And um, you know, it took a lot of work to earn the trust of the people that she lived among, many of whom were very suspicious of her. What is she doing here? Who is she working for? Why is she here to surveil us, to watch us, to, to kind of keep us in line? But over the course of her, of her adult life, um, she really earned their trust and uh, together, helped uh, forge kind of movements for justice and equality in, in that part of the city. I think of someone like Ida B. Wells, who was a, an anti-lynching advocate, you know, incredibly courageous, driven by her faith to speak up against the heinous crime of lynching. Um, you know, she had, she had been in Memphis, Tennessee um, during a lynching in the early 1890s, and it led her on a transatlantic crusade, um, speaking again out of her faith to the equal rights and equal dignity of all human beings. Um, and in, in the case of Ida B. Wells, really, she did that at, uh, you know, with, with her life um, very much on the line. That was a dangerous thing for a black woman to be doing in the 1890s. So social Christianity really gets going in kind of those decades after the Civil War. It takes deeper root in the early 20th century. This is a period when Institutional churches, uh, every denomination starts to found um, commissions and committees to study labor and to study race and to study all the kind of difficult challenges 
that industrialization had produced. Uh, Protestant denominations, including the Presbyterian Church and the Methodists and, and about 20 some odd uh, denominations came together and ratified a social creed in 1908. They kind of got political, so to speak, not in a partisan way, but, but in a way of, of, of speaking clearly to, into the public square, calling for the abolition of child labor, calling for a living wage, calling for the abatement of poverty and other sorts of things that um, continue to be issues into the present day. Um, we can really see, you know, the, the institutionalization, the kind of growing prominence of social Christianity in the early 20th century, not just in the church and what the churches were doing and the, the statements that they were issuing, but also in the state and in the rising concern for equality that you saw throughout the progressive era, really culminating in the New Deal, um, which many of the architects of the New Deal were steeped in this kind of social Christian tradition and saw the the kind of new deal and the welfare state things like social security um things like uh sort of labor rights and whatnot they saw it uh and again we can we can disagree with them or agree with them um but it's worth kind of remembering that they they saw the new deal as a kind of living out of the sermon on the mount bringing kind of uh, applied christianity to life in the world today um, and that was how they tried to pitch it, actually, to uh, an overwhelmingly Christian public in the 1930s. What we know, so if, if social Christianity gets its start in the kind of decades after the Civil War, if it kind of picks up steam in many ways in the early 20th century and kind of takes deeper root in the institutions that structure our common life. What we know, and as I mentioned in the, in the, in the session on race, is that there was a big backlash against the New Deal. And... Um, and so in the, in the sort of decades after the 1930s, I think the action really moved back to the grassroots. And it was during those decades, the 1930s and 40s and 50s into the 60s, that you get the rise of these massive faith-infused labor and civil rights movements where people, uh, you know, sort of ordinary men um, and women in the labor movement, uh, to be sure, and also, you know, extremely well-known people, folks like Martin Luther King Jr., folks like Cesar Chavez, uh, folks like Dorothy Day, um, Amelia Boynton, uh, uh, you know, a name that's been too quickly forgotten, but one of the kind of most courageous advocates for voting rights in Selma, Alabama, uh, advocating for voting rights long before Martin Luther King showed up on the scene. All of these folks are folks who found in their faith a calling to fight for a more equal world, a more equal society. Um, and, and by the time the movements that people like Dorothy Day and Amelia Boynton and Martin Luther King Jr. and Cesar Chavez, by the time those movements were cresting in the 1960s and the 1970s, what we know is that the nation was more equal on most fronts um, than we've ever seen before or since. It was, again, just to sort of say that very clearly, we were more equal by the early 1970s on many, many counts, um, especially in terms of kind of the income gap and the wealth gap, uh, more equal uh, than we've ever been before or since. So in many ways, this tradition, the social Christian tradition, uh, made a huge impact on the nation. and and. Um, you know, really brought the nation to a place of, of greater equality. And so as we sit here today, um, you know, a generation removed or more from the, high, the sort of heyday of social Christianity and a generation or more into the kind of heyday of the moral majority, um, I think it's important to remember uh, this earlier tradition and the impact that it made um, the different kinds of ways that people in that era were connecting Christian faith um, to public life and the ways that they were connecting kind of what does it mean when we talk about uh, wanting to sort of see Christian values come to life in our midst, uh, a more just and equal world. Um, they were doing that too. So the story of kind of uh, uh, a kind of only one way to connect Christian faith to public life, I think needs to be complicated by a kind of understanding of a of, of the kind of full breadth of the Christian witness. So in the moment we're in today, you know, we're headed for an election, and I don't know what uh, your congregation may think about the election. I don't know what you may think about the moral majority or about social Christianity, but I think um, the thing I would encourage you to, to think about and to maybe talk about together um, one of the temptations, I think, in, in American Christian life has been to, to become 
extremely partisan to kiss to sort of over identify uh, kind of Christianity with a particular partisan um, position. Um, another tradition, uh, sort of another temptation, excuse me, uh, is to to kind of go apolitical and to say, well, um, the gospel just has nothing to do with politics. It's a personal kind of spiritual message. Um, and I think that's actually another way that as Christians, we can go uh, astray. You know, in fact, uh, it was what Martin Luther King warned about in his letter from Birmingham jail, as you'll recall, was this idea that as Christians, we might be able to just sort of you know, many white Christians in that moment were thinking that they could just sort of stay on the sidelines and that they would be able to be faithful um, there on the sidelines. And I think uh, if you if you believe King, um, at least that that actually our faith does call us into the public square because many of the things that happen in that place um, are related and, and connected. They're deeply connected to themes in the in the Bible. They're deeply connected to themes in the Christian tradition. So as you think about um sort of issues of Christian faith and public life and how this all connects to our identity as believers, both as individuals and in community. Um, I would encourage you, not, you know, if, if, to the extent that you can, to kind of keep these different temptations in mind, the temptation to go too partisan, the temptation to kind of go entirely apolitical. Um, and I, what I would do is sort of part of the, the spirit, I guess, in which I want to offer you the story of the social Christian tradition is to say that I think we're going to be at our best as Christians in the public square if we kind of lean deeper into the the tradition, lean deeper into the scriptures, and and um, really pay attention to the kind of great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us. It's good to know about uh, things that have happened in the last generation, but I think it, it's worthwhile to to pause and to really reach all the way back. Um, and and find more stories of those who've gone before us because I think they've still got something to teach us today. So with that, I will leave you and uh, wish you all the best. And I hope that uh, the conversation will be rich and fruitful. And I wish you every blessing as you continue to navigate, your congregation continues to navigate uh, the challenges of this pandemic and um, everything else that's going on in the world. Blessings to you all.